China is accused of detaining more than a million Uyghur Muslims. U.S. politicians have called for sanctions against the Chinese officials responsible. There are reports of torture and indoctrination in secret camps. So are the basic religious and cultural rights of an entire people under threat? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I am Hashim Ahalbara. The International Day of the Victims of Enforced Disappearances is commemorated by the United Nations on Thursday to remember the tens of thousands of people, maybe hundreds of thousands, abducted by police or government agents in various countries around the world. Today's Inside Story is focusing on China and the western region of Qingqiang, where United Nations human rights experts say more than a million ethnic Uyghurs are being held in what resembles a massive internment camp shrouded in secrecy, a sort of no rights zone. China denies such camps exist, but says criminals involved in minor offenses are sent to what it calls vocational education and employment training centers to help with their reintegration into society. Most Uyghurs practice Islam and speak a Turkic language that's completely different from Mandarin Chinese. 10 million of them live mostly in the Xinjiang region of Western China. Ethnic tensions have risen over the years since 1949 after the communist government encouraged the mass migration of Han Chinese. Uyghurs share ethnic and cultural similarities with their neighbors in Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Kazakhstan and Mongolia. China says its crackdown in Xinjiang is to protect peace and prevent what it calls terrorism. There have been ethnic riots in recent years in, and Uyghur separatists have been blamed for several attacks, including one in Beijing's Tiananmen Square in 2013. Let's introduce our panel of experts in Hong Kong. Andrew Leong, an international and independent China strategist. In Nottingham, in the UK, Andreas Fulda, a lecturer at the University of Nottingham. And in Kontel, Germany, by Skype, Adrian Zenz, an expert on China's minority policy. Welcome to you all. Mr. Andrew, what is happening in the Uyghur areas? The UN says this is a forced uh, attempt by the government to change the very identity of the Uyghur people? Um, I think the, main, the problem at the moment uh, is China's uh, fear uh, of separatism. Uh, now, let's face it, uh, separatism um, is, is a no-no for any country, including uh, democratic advanced countries like Spain. Um, and think about, you know, sort of Catalonia. But I think in China, it's even more... Um, um, uh, 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 gives uh, more, informs more anxiety because um, uh, Xinjiang is a large area and of course it's not just the Xinjiang, um, mm -hmm. the Uyghur people, um, which is now um, connected with the uh, um, Eastern Turkestan uh, terrorist movement elsewhere, uh, but also it would uh, drive uh, separatism movements in Tibet. Um, and also um, in, even in uh, Taiwan, um, let alone Hong Kong and Macau. So I think that um, China's, uh, the Beijing is ab absolutely um, anxious to control the situation. Mm -hmm. um, what has caused the problem? If you look at the, um, the, the, the com uh, complexity of all the uh, ethnic groups in China, China is a multi-ethnic uh, country uh, consisting of 56 ethnic groups. Of course, the Hang Chinese accounts for more than 95% mm -hmm. uh, of the total population. But l there are, you know, sort of uh, over 50 but, um, ethnic groups. And only the, um, uh, the, um, um, uh, the, the Uyghurs uh, and the Tibetans uh, have, are causing problems. The rest mm -hmm. are living in okay. great harmony uh, with the Hang Chinese. But the now, the reason is because in recent years, as you highlighted earlier, there was a mass migration of the Hang Chinese into Xinjiang, and then the Xinjiang people feel that they are being overwhelmed, 
um, and also as they feel that there's erosion uh, of their culture uh, okay. and, and access to, to jobs and so on and so forth. Uh, so the uh, kind of measures, suppressive measures, uh, is, uh, can be counterproductive. Okay, um, so Andreas, uh, does the fear of extremism justify putting one million people in some sort of deten uh, detention, forcing them to uh, change the system of beliefs? Well, first of all, I would like to thank you and uh, Al Jazeera for uh, bringing to your audience's uh, attention the fact that hundreds of thousands of Uyghurs are indeed held in political re-education camps in their homeland, uh, Xinjiang. And uh, I've agreed to come to, you know, onto this show um, because I believe that facing a situation like that, uh, the community of China scholars cannot uh, remain uh, silent. Uh, to answer your question directly, I don't think that any of these measures are justifiable. The kind of response we've just heard from Andrew is uh, indefensible because, of course, uh, separatist movements exist in various countries. but. They never, the existence of um, dissent never justifies such draconian measures. Um, because what we're seeing uh, in mainland China is basically the implementation of a highly racist policy aimed s squarely at an ethnic group uh, where anyone, uh, regardless of his or her uh, political or religious views, can be swept up in these internment camps. And that is a huge problem. It's something that we need to talk about because it's unacceptable. Mm -hmm. Adrian, are we talking here about a push by the Chinese government to contain the rise of what it describes as extremism or a planned attempt by the government to change the identity of an entire people? Well, from the Chinese perspective, it is probably both. Both are being conflated. Uh, for the Chinese state, um, any sense of a people being different, and especially a sense of people being religious, uh, has always been seen with suspicion. The Uyghurs are an ethnic group that have had a different uh, historic and linguistic and cultural identity for a long time. Um, as a matter of fact, very few of them uh, are seriously interested in some kind of independence. But the problem is that the Chinese have long had a sense of cultural distance to these people. Mm -hmm. Therefore, for the Chinese state in many ways, reducing cultural difference or linguistic difference, and especially reducing or suppressing religious identity, is equivalent to counterterrorism. And that's in many ways what we are seeing in Xinjiang. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Andrew, Leong, the Chinese government has said over the past few months that it's basically trying to improve the living standards of the people in the Uyghur area. But here's a problem with, the, with this particular approach. I mean, how can you defend some sort of Orwellian Big Brother society in modern times and say that people need to go to re-education centres to be sort of indoctrinated? I mean, who accepts such a, a policy in, in these days? I think there is no doubt uh, that in the so-called inner provinces in China, in, um, such as Xinjiang and also Tibet and some of the more remote provinces, um, the economic development has been uh, phenomenal. I mean, the per GDP per capita, uh, the life expectancy, uh, the literacy rates, uh, by all measures, they are improving. But then, on, on the other hand, there is a cultural and ethnic religious divide uh, between the, uh, the Hang Chinese as well as the, um, um, the native um, um, groups, uh, particularly in, in Xinjiang and Tibet, for example. Mm -hmm. um, they, because they, these are rather remote areas in the past, and so they, they, they tend to regard their culture as uh, segregated from the, uh, from the other um, uh, groups, in uh, major ethnic groups like the Hang Chinese um, in China for a long, long time. But nevertheless, it's not as if they were completely segregated. If you look at history, back in the um, even the um, um, the Ming Dynasty or the Qing Dynasty, you know, dating back several hundred years ago, uh, there were o o already about thirty percent of the Hang Chinese, um, uh, the ethnic Hang uh, group, uh, in the Xinjiang province. Uh, but then, in recent years, the problems of of uh, um, ethnic conflict uh, mm -hmm. seem to have flared up because um, 
the division between the access to, to jobs, uh, to markets, uh, has become much more pro pronounced. And there is a, uh, even a much, much larger number of Hang Chinese mm -hmm. settling in um, Urumqi and others. And the other problem is, of course, uh, southern Tibet, which is the area which is um, uh, associated with the eastern Turkestan movement. And, and that is linked together with other, you know, sort of um, uh, terrorist groups elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, um, they, they, there, are, there have been, in recent years, quite a number of terrorist activities throughout so, China. Okay, uh, I, I, and of course, China's, uh, as China grows in, in national gravitas, is subject to, to, to all these uh, perceived threats from the, from the West, all including right. um, ideology. Okay. Um, so that, that's why th uh, there was a feedback uh, of repressive measures. Okay, Mr. Andreas, are we talking here about, just to, to, to further explain the, the whole issue to our audience, are we talking about ethnic discrimination, religious persecution, or is there is more to this particular story about the Chinese government and the Uyghurs? Sure. I mean, I think uh, when we just listen to Andrew, it's quite clear that we shouldn't um, be hoodwinked by these kind of uh, phony arguments about development status, uh, uh, etc. Uh, the real issue here is that uh, the Chinese Communist Party is using extrajudicial uh, extrajudicial measures uh, to imprison um, Chinese citizens because Uyghurs are, of course, Chinese citizens um, against its own laws. So, for example, when you read the legal commentary about the situation, there are actually no rules and regulations that justify these actions. Um, uh, the Chinese Communist Party is, of course, not bound by the rule of law. It uh, uses the rule by law to govern China, but uh, there is no um, constitutional basis or no law that, um, no Chinese law that um, allows the indefinite um, uh, uh, internment of people. Now, uh, of course, there is um, now a law that exists, which is uh, the counterterrorism law, uh, which allows for what's called educational placement, and that could indeed be indefinite, but um, anyone who is then uh, placed mm -hmm. under such educational placement would have uh, to be um, indicted first on terrorist charges, uh, uh, go through a, a legal process of um, uh, imprisonment, and then after being released from prison, then this could, uh, you know, take place. But clearly, 100,000, close to a million of Uyghurs who are ending up in, this, in, in, in these camps, they are not um, mm -hmm. terrorists. Mm -hmm. uh, they're probably not even uh, close to terrorist sympathizers. So, so to, to justify that um, by any measure is um, highly problematic. Okay. Adrian, uh, activists have been saying that, for example, in 2017, one fifth of all the arrests in China have been made in the Xinjiang region. Could this be an indication that the government has completely failed to find a political way out to the problem and that's now moving one notch further towards harsh measures? The government, if we look at this historically, has tried uh, several approaches. In the 1990s and early 2000s, we see a developmentalist approach with the Great Western Development Initiative with the belief that large injections of funding from the top down would make a profound change in the region. Of course, this has caused many problematic side effects, such as an influx of Han settlers. The next strategy was to bring in uh, Chen Quengo, a strong man who formerly ruled Tibet, and he recruited um, tens of thousands, close to 100,000 new police, uh, building thousands of new police stations, installing sophisticated surveillance technology, facial recognition cameras. Now, the interesting thing is this re-education drive uh, represents an entirely new dimension, something that we have not seen in other parts of China on this scale in recent history, not in Tibet either. So this is the next level. And I believe we can only speculate in some ways what the actual reasons are. But I believe that the Chinese government feels you can't just put a policeman next to every Uyghur. Mm -hmm. They're looking for a long-term solution. What is the long-term solution? It is, as government's documents call it, I'm sorry, I repeat this. It is, as government documents call it, seeking a hard change. So the long-term change is to thoroughly change an entire people, resulting, however, in the criminalization of the entire belief system. Mm -hmm.
OK, Mr. Andrew, I mean, in theory, uh, Xinjiang is considered an autonomous region with a self-appointed local government. But, you know, everyone knows that the guy who caused the final shots is Chen Chuangguo, the man who has been in Tibet known for his harsh uh, measures and iron fist policy. Many are concerned that the man is trying to completely clamp down on dissent and uh, opposition in the uh, Xinjiang region. Well, I think this is a uh, vicious circle. Um, the more um, Beijing is uh, anxious about the separatist movements uh, and the perpetration of terrorist acts and the per uh, perceived um, foreign interference uh, in trying to ferment uh, the fragmentation of China, the more Beijing um, tightens the grip. Uh, but that, that is counterproductive, as I was saying. Um, on the one hand, of course, the economic benefits uh, and infrastructural links uh, with the rest of the provinces would help the, um, the, the, these remote regions to grow. But on the other hand... You're talking uh, about... You're talking about... I'm, uh, their so, cultural I'm sorry to... Their I'm, ethnic... Mr. Andrew, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you here, but you're talking about the Xinjiang region as a, a poor area. It has massive natural resources potential. It's a rich region on its own. The problem is not this. The problem is purely about persecution here. Yeah. Um, as I was saying, the, the, um, uh, these uh, repressive measures are uh, counterproductive. Um, and there is a vicious circle. The more uh, Beijing um, imposes these measures uh, on um, um, a sector, sector of, the, of the Xinjiang people, uh, the more they are likely to uh, to feel a strange and 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 re and and reactive uh, against the Beijing government. So I think that there's. Um, uh, but on the other hand, uh, there is no way that the Beijing would um, just let go because this is an existential threat mm -hmm. to the whole whole country. And in fact, no country would allow separate movements. You're talking That's about 11 this. million people um, out of a nation of saying, uh, more than earlier, a billion people. Uh, I mean, why would this be considered as an existential threat? This, this should be the court of democracy, respecting the rights of the minority, well, Mr. And Andrew. Well, I mean, if we look at the area of Xinjiang, it is huge. I mean, it is one of the largest uh, provinces in China. Um, and so in, even in, in terms of numbers, uh, that may be okay. um, relatively small percentage. But on the other hand, there is a, uh, an, an, an impact and, and effect. Uh, what about Tibet? And Tibet also, if you look at the number of Tibetan people, the number is not that large. But on the other, on the other hand, the provinces are again huge. Okay. Um, and not only the, in terms of size, but in terms of, um, as you mentioned earlier, resources and the connectivity of China uh, with the barren road with the rest of the world. Let's talk a little bit now about the international reaction. This is going to be my question to Andreas. I mean, there's been a report by the United Nations about a few weeks ago. Now, there's this letter by U.S. senators and congressman saying that there needs to be some strong, robust reaction, particularly imposing sanctions on individuals, companies, on anyone responsible for the atrocities committed against the Uyghur people. Do you think that the Americans would follow suit and take action? Uh, well, first of all, uh, Jessica Butker from China File made the suggestion, and I think it's a very good suggestion to U.S. policymakers uh, to make good use of the Global Magnitsky Act, which allows uh, the American government to um, block the property, the overseas property of individuals who have engaged in uh, endemic human rights um, abuses and uh, corruption. Now, I would think that um, the strongman uh, Chen, uh, Chen Chuanguo um, very likely uh, qualifies for uh, being um, a subject to the Global Magnitsky Act. And this is something uh, that could be considered more widely uh, because I think for the international community, whether it's the United States, uh, the European Union or any other country, to just turn a blind eye to the situation in Xinjiang is uh, not an option. If any one of your viewers are rightly uh, concerned, for example, about the racist immigration policies of the Trump administration mm -hmm. where families are being ripped apart, um, bear in mind that what's happening in Xinjiang is far worse uh, that the scope of the problem is far bigger and that mu much more families are being ripped apart as we speak. And mm -hmm. uh, many of the children of the uh, imprisoned uh, Uyghurs are actually now um, growing up in uh, Chinese orphanages. And I think that is totally and utterly unacceptable. 
uh, we, we have an obligation uh, to speak out about these kind of things. And I think a, a very practical step beyond government is that uh, uh, people around the world should educate themselves about what is happening in Xinjiang by uh, following the news, for example, by Asia Dialogue from the Asia Research Center, China Dialogue from the University of Berkeley, or China File from the Asia Society, which have been uh, doing ex excellent work on, on Xinjiang and uh, bringing information, up-to-date information about the situation mm -hmm. on the ground. Adrian, in a country like China, which has historically been thin-skinned when it comes to international criticism, do you think that if we build up momentum, if there's been a momentum in the of the UN, EU, the US, that could pay off or ultimately end up being counterproductive? Now, on the one hand, there is a possibility that the Chinese position will be hardened by being challenged in an international way. However, we also need to consider that the Chinese are at a time where they're really trying to convince the rest of the world of their progress, of their developments and in a sense of their alternative uh, understanding of the world order. Therefore, the Chinese, I think, are inherently interested in how they're being perceived, especially in the context now of the Belt and Road Initiative. Now, Xinjiang, of course, is the so-called core hub of the Belt and Road Initiative. Nearly all transport that goes on land routes uh, passes through Xinjiang. A lot of the strategic economic development is happening there. And therefore, I believe if this is being raised um, mm -hmm. internationally in a consistent and systematic way, what's happening in Xinjiang today, I believe this is actually very necessary. Mm -hmm. And uh, if it turns out to hardening the Chinese position, I still believe it is a risk that should be taken. Mm -hmm. Mr. Andrew, we're talking about, um, at the end of the day, we're talking about China, one of the biggest economies in the world. And many governments are scared to the point of raising this issue with the Chinese government. Is this something that you think could embolden the Chinese government to continue its clampdown on the Uyghurs? Well, I mean, this is not the first time uh, perceived uh, per per um, violations of human rights uh, raised their eyebrows in the West. And in fact, uh, China has been taken to task uh, in many forums, including the United Nations. Um, and other uh, um, uh, venues. Um, but I think that at this particular time, um, again, raising this uh, question in a more aggressive way against China uh, could feed into this kind of vicious circle. Because <laughs> I, I think that there is a perception now uh, with the trade war, uh, with the United States, uh, with the, um, the West raising various concerns about China, um, there is a perception that the whole world is ganging up against China mm -hmm. in, in more ways than one, um, economically, financially, militarily, and now ideologically. Uh, but on the other hand, it is right and proper uh, for the West to, to, to raise these issues. But I think there are many other ways as well uh, to engage the Chinese government, okay. uh, especially through uh, programs or uh, think tanks or academic uh, forums and, and even um, 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 cooperation with various NGOs. Mr. Andreas. Um, oh. But I, I think that it's right and proper for this to be raised. But one has got to understand where China is coming from. We do, we do. Uh, Andreas, this is going to be my last question in less than a minute, please. In this strange world, as Andrew Leung was basically saying, where the populists are taking over, where the uh, far-right governments now are emerging, do you think that the minorities will have to wait a long time before they can have their own rights uh, um, respected? Well, certainly I think one of the issues is that uh, Chinese citizens uh, those who reside within the People's Republic of China and those who are um, living all over the world, they have to pay attention as well. And I think, um, I don't think that the Chinese Communist Party actually um, acts in their name. Uh, the things that happen in Xinjiang, probably most Chinese people, Chinese citizens are not aware of. If they are aware, I think they would take a very critical view of uh, such government actions. And I, I think ultimately it will depend on how Chinese citizens view this. Andrew Leung, Andreas Fulda, Adrian Zanz, thank you very much indeed. Looking forward to seeing you in the near future. And thank you again for watching the programme. You can see uh, it's 
inside story again anytime by visiting our website aljazeera.com for further discussion go to our facebook page that's facebook.com forward slash aj inside story you can also join the conversation on twitter our handle is at aj inside story from me hashim ahalbaran the whole team here bye for now